Now I'm going to look at some political shifts, but also some environmental shifts at the end. We think about who had power in 1900. Well, there's a few different countries you could say which is a dominant country. The British, maybe the Russians, maybe the United States, Japan, China, what have you. But at the same time, we weren't too cooperative. Uh, you know, how do I know this? Look at World War I, World War II. Uh, there was a lot of conflict, a lot of death uh, as a result of war. After World War II, though, what ended up happening is we had more of a, of a bipolar world as we go through the whole nuclear age and the Cold War, where the United States, uh, in, in, our, in our philosophy, uh, our free market philosophy, let's say, and the Soviets, and communism, and all of that, and their philosophy. Eventually, the USSR, Soviets fell, and it became a unipolar world. What that means is one country dominated, and that one country would be the US of A. And so our system, our global common market system, is what uh, uh, you know, ended up winning over uh, the rest of the world. And so when we think about the economic shifts, we go back to that global common market. Well, a lot of it has to do with the, uh, kind of the power structure at the global level. Today, I would argue we're back to very much a multipolar uh, situation, a multipolar world, uh, very much like 1900, but definitely more cooperative. And so you might not believe me if, you, uh, if a terrorist event happens or if another conflict occurs in the world, but overwhelmingly compared to uh, the previous century, we are much more cooperative. Key to that, the key to the shift in terms of overall global cooperation and just understanding just general awareness of, of different uh, conflicts and who's getting screwed over and who's getting ethnically cleansed and who's getting wiped out by an evil dictator is the shift in just our overall awareness of what's going on in the world. Key to this are supranational organizations. This is a key term, definition, in which you're going to see this come up throughout the rest of this uh, uh, the semester and the rest of this text. So that's why I'm talking about it now. Supranationalist organizations are kind of as they, they popped up as a result, uh, you could say, of World War II when we were just wanting to, okay, we just went through basically 50 years of war. Let's get, kind of have some peace. Let's get together. And so these supranational organizations, the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, or the World Health Organization, are examples of supranational organizations. And what these are is where these different countries of the world, they come together. Uh, and so they come together with a shared agreement, the shared goal of where that organization might be. And so that might be economic, might be political, might be for security, might be for defense, uh, could be for cultural reasons, like the Arab, Arab League, for example. And so all these are examples of of groups coming together, the idea together everyone achieves more, the acronym for TEAM. Um, so that's the idea here, and it's just definitely a new characteristic that goes along with globalization, and we think definitely here uh, in terms of political structure. And so when we think about, you know, last 50 to 75 years, these supranational organizations have had a huge role, have had a huge amount of power, and so some would argue even more than individual countries as far as of their role and their power and their significance. But another characteristic, another political shift is regionalization. So the idea that countries that border each other, they start to regionalize and they start to realize that well, together we're probably better off than just as our own individual countries. Some examples, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, which is an agreement between the United States, our neighbor to the North Canada, and our neighbor to the South, Mexico. The European Union, numerous countries within Europe, together have regionalized, with one reason being, you know, they see the United States, we've got these 50 states, and of course a couple territories in the D.C., uh, but they see, see well, we've got these individual states, we're all doing our own little thing, uh, but together, bow, wow, we are quite powerful. And so they thought, well, how can we compete against the United States? Well, we'll just regionalize, we'll come together. Uh, other examples, the ASEAN, uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, the Africa Union, uh, Mercosur, uh, in, in South America. And so all of these are examples of regionalization where countries near each other start to come together with the shared goal, the shared idea that they can cooperate, but they can compete globally better off if they regionalize. So I ask you, globally, who currently has power? Now globally, who has power? Of course, we could say individual countries or individual governments, let's say. Uh, but I would almost argue the governments are just become containers uh, for all these various organizations, all these various groups that might have power. So who has power? 
Here's a list of all the people I would argue has power. First off, globally, we definitely have six individual major powers. The United States, China, the EU, European Union, India, Japan, Russia. Some of those, just because they're so, so big population-wise, others because of their economic significance and economic power. We also have regional powers. When we look at Brazil. It is definitely the regional power, along with Argentina there in South America. Mexico, definitely the regional power in Central America, and along with Venezuela, has a large role there in Latin America and Central America. Nigeria, definitely has huge power there in West Africa, whereas in the southern part of Africa, for sure, South Africa. In terms of supranational organizations I mentioned beforehand, no doubt they have power. The various examples of regionalization, they also have power. You could argue individual places within countries, states like California, huge economy in California, New York City. In fact, metropolitan New York City, as far as its economy, is about the same uh, as Mexico. It's like the, about the 14th best if it was its own country. You could throw in Shanghai, London, other examples of cosmopolitan countries or cities that have a huge role in the global economy and have a huge role in the global politi political structure. Multinational corporations, I already mentioned them beforehand. The media, the media has a huge role as far as distributing information. We've seen how that's evolved. I get all my news, I get it from Twitter. I don't even get on the news anymore. And so when news breaks, I go to Twitter and find out uh, before the news reports uh, you know, get out there. Further, there's a group in anon called Anonymous, in which uh, they have power. Uh, you could also say non-governmental organizations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which you know half the time uh, their ideas don't work, uh, but they just still nonetheless have huge power as far as you know their their, uh, their role, especially in developing countries. Yeah, there are other examples of of NGOs, Doctors Without Borders, for example. Another way to showcase who has power, who has influence, who employs the most number of people, and so our top five corporations or entities. Uh, as far as employers in the world, number one, the United States Department of Defense with 3.2 million employees or thereabouts. Number two, the Chinese People Liberation Army, essentially the Chinese military with 2.3 million. Number three, Walmart, 2.1 million. Number four, McDonald's, 1.7 million. And then number five, a Chinese state-run oil company. So essentially two of those five are multinational corporations. Which together, when I talk about who has power, I show the various entities, show the examples as far as key, uh, you know, McDonald's and, and Walmart. I argue that what's happening is you're seeing an increasing importance of multinational corporations, regionalization, global alliances, supranational organizations, and subsequently a decreasing importance of individual governments. I'm not going to use a, an example here to showcase the role of governments and how the governments in different countries and can play a role in what happens in Indiana and meth. And so meth production actually increased in Indiana in the 2000s. Why? Well, what happened in the late 2000s was Mexico, uh, inside the country of Mexico, policymakers or the government of Mexico said, you know what, we want to clamp down on uh, the key ingredients for meth, uh, pseudoephedrine. Uh, and federin would be the two key ingredients. And so what they did was they banned imports of this these drugs so that they could then not be then produced into meth and then sent to uh, Indiana uh, via network diffusion. And so essentially what happened was uh, the source area or the source of meth uh, essentially dried up in Mexico because of the government clamping down there. And so we see the role of politics uh, from a different country influencing now because of that people want their meth and of course in indiana uh, meth is definitely a, 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 a something that is more widely consumed by rural white people so missouri tennessee kentucky indiana where we see a lot of rural white people are very much meth users and so what happened was then production increased in indiana because it wasn't uh, you know couldn't get it from mexico anymore so we look at meth production in, in, in Indiana, it actually increases as a result of politics or political decisions in a different country. Further, looking at environmental shifts. And so this relates to you know, the, definitely the economy. So when we think about economic shifts, you know, no doubt that the Industrial Revolution was all about fossil fuels and all about using energy. And where are we going to get that energy from? We're going to get it from coal. We're going to get it from oil. We're going to get it from trees, biomass. 
And so all of that has led to increased environmental degradation. And before we begin, I want to make sure that you know, I, you know I'm not a I'm not a left wing liberal tree hugger, but I'm also not a right wing uh, person. It's all about just well, who cares? It's all about the economy. I'm somewhere in the middle, and I take treat everything very much fair and balanced. So when I'm looking at environmental changes, I'm not going to come at it with a certain political perspective that I'm going to be one side and I'm going to throw that side or shove that side or my viewpoint down your throat. All I'm saying is there's no doubt that globalization has led to fewer forests, larger deserts, melting glaciers, subsequently rising sea levels. No doubt about it. In a cool way to kind of showcase human how we've adapted and but also modified the environment, see if you can try to guess what this land area is right here. It is actually New York City. And so what this was, a visualization produced by, I believe, NASA, who what they did was they essentially uh, kind of did a what if, what would uh, Manhattan look like before New York City was there? And so no doubt that as humans grow, as population size increases, as we also develop and, you know, industrial revolution, we create better steel so we can build bi uh, bigger buildings, no doubt leads to environmental change. Here we have a remotely sensed photo, uh, aerial photograph from a satellite of the Amazon rainforest here in 1999. What we can see, the brown areas are areas that have been cleared and deforested. So in the Amazon rainforest, there's definitely a particular pattern. It almost looks like fingers, almost like, like fish bones, in which what they'll do is they'll cut into an area uh, very much in a straight pattern and then go off of that uh, via v various fingers as they continue to deforest this particular area. What's going on here is there's a variety of reasons why uh, you're seeing the trees cut down here. Uh, but one key reason is the fact that now all of a sudden there's this demand for Brazilian steak. Globally, people want Brazilian steak. Uh, when really, steak is steak. It just comes from a cow. It doesn't really matter where uh, the cow lives. Um, so because of that, they're clearing the rainforest so they can then produce more fields produce more uh, pastures for cows uh, to graze. And so here we'll see, I'll put in the, uh, the uh, more recent, and you can see how this deforestation in 2009, just 10 years from, uh, after that previous image, how much this area has been cleared. Now we'll go to mid the Middle East here in Dubai. And what we have here is, of course, uh, the Middle East, a very, very dry area. If you don't know that, uh, now you do. And so what this, this map shows is the red areas is actually vegetation. So this is an aerial photograph in which they, uh, they, they detect uh, the vegetation in color red so it's more obvious to be seen here. And so as I move in this image, move into 2010, first off, of course, there's the islands that they've created. So essentially they've created islands uh, in the middle of a, uh, of a, of a water body on, off the coast here in the sea. But also what we can see here is more development on the land. And why is that a key problem, key issue, is we see more red on the map. That means more vegetation. So the problem here is you have an area that doesn't get much precipitation. And you're adding more vegetation, which requires more precipitation. So you're going to have to truck in that water. And so you can see how environmental degradation. So as what's happening is Dubai wants to become... And this, this area wants to become this cosmopolitan, this world city that tracks all these people and it's showcases we're more than just desert, we're more than just oil. But then what that leads to is a definitely environmental change. This is really, you can really see this here in this, uh, this uh, video of Las Vegas. Uh, so this shows Las Vegas over a 25-year uh, time frame in which Las Vegas is one of the fastest growing areas of the country. Well, was one of the fastest areas of the country because, oh, people love sin. People love... Uh, prostitutes, people love gambling, people love casinos, people love, you know, uh, I guess big buffets. So they move here and you can see how it leads to environmental change. So I mentioned beforehand this car, the Tata uh, Nano, in which it, you know, once again, everyone across the world now wants to drive cars. We want to have our own personal uh, vehicle. And so, uh, you know, one of the outcomes of that is more cars equals more air pollution. And so now that we have more cars out there, as more and more people want to, uh, to have their own vehicle, let's think about the construction of one automobile. And so here's research from 2004 that found that construct one automobile, it requires 605,000 plus gallons of water for the parts and the tires, 682 pounds of pollution I mine for the lead battery, 
2,000 pounds of discharge into the local water supply for the 22 pounds of copper contained in the car. All of this just for one car. So we think about, you know, we think about, you know, the, the global economy. One key aspect is common market. We're all essentially linked up. We're all, for the most part, buying similar things. We can understand, though, there's environmental change, environmental degradation as a result. Probably the coolest thing from this research, I would argue, is this guy's last name. That is one heck of a last name. And so now when we look at CO2 emissions per capita, once again, CO2 comes from a variety of sources, but one of them being automobiles. Those countries that are red, in this case from this Yale University Environmental Performance Index, countries that are red are, are bad, uh, are polluters, are heavy CO2 uh, emitters. And a lot of these are car, car crazy areas. And so places we don't see, places that are currently green, India, kind of China, um, you know, parts of Africa, parts of South America, all places where the automobile is only going to be increasing going forward, uh, especially as those places, the uh, disposable income or the extra income uh, of the average person will only increase over time. Further, to bring us back down to the scale of Indiana, in terms of the top 10 overall, uh, as far as emissions, CO2 emissions, Indiana or number 7. But that isn't, isn't always a good thing to be uh, in the top 10 of a list. Further, if we break that down, I mean, that previous was just pure numbers, which if we're competing with those other states just in basic numbers, that's not too good. But when we look at per capita, uh, we're also in the top 10. So what's going on there is we have A, in Indiana, cheap coal. Um, so coal is key to, uh, a key to uh, our, our energy source. And, of course, it pollutes. Also, we're very, very auto-dependent. We've already talked about that regarding Indianapolis. Further, we've got the highways, the crossroads of America. So we have a lot of people bringing their polluting cars, bringing them through the state, bringing them through Indianapolis, just on their way uh, going from one state to another state. So we have all these various factors that help to explain why in Indiana we are not good in terms of CO2 emissions. But of course, make a positive out of all of this so-called negative is definitely we do have more international awareness we, you know we have nasa in their photographs we have you know china now being you know aware hey 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 look at this you know your your data ain't good uh, and so here's evidence that uh, you need to clean up your act uh, so we get more international debate so you know climate change is it is it human cause or is it not well let's have an international discussion about it uh, let's have international research international scientists uh, come up and share ideas, share research, share uh, various viewpoints. And so one of the things is we do have more understanding, awareness of environmental issues as a result of this globalized era.